Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I've got a project you might want to be involved in if you escaped a religion or faith culture or cult. This broadcast is wrapped around the hashtag I left because it's a hashtag popularized by Chrissy Stroop. I've been posting a lot of her stuff lately because I've been such a big fan. She's going to join me to help set up the rest of the show in just a few minutes. But I'm going to do a video montage as well. If you want to tell in just a few minutes your story about how and why you escaped, you got out, you crawled out of the cocoon, and you want to talk about how that happened and maybe give a message to the people who are still trapped in it, record a short video, make sure the audio and the lighting is good or as good as you can get it, and email that clip or Google Drive it or Dropbox it or whatever to Seth at the thinking atheist. Dot com. Let's call the deadline for submissions the last day of the month, January 31st, 2021. I can't guarantee I will be able to use every submission, but I'll use as many as I can, and I will take those, and I'm going to create kind of a montage of stories from our listeners for a video release to YouTube in the coming weeks. Would you like to tell your story? Submit your short video, Seth at the thinking atheist dot com. A lot of resources out there for people who are dealing with an escape from a difficult past or circumstances. We've talked a lot about recovering from religion dot org. Let me also recommend a series by trauma specialist Molly Burkholm. She has a series at the Great Courses Plus. It's called Building Your Resilience, Finding Meaning in Adversity. Now, what I like is that she's not treating adversity like it's some kind of divine gauntlet that is designed to toughen us up, right? Instead, she's talking about how life happens. How do we adapt and cope with everyday problems? How do we train ourselves to overcome? So if you are struggling with baggage and stress and trauma recovery or just dealing with this crazy world we live in, building your resilience is something you really ought to check out at The Great Courses Plus, just one of thousands of lectures on so many topics that stream whenever and wherever you want, including on The Great Courses Plus app. Enter the new year mentally stronger. Get the tools to do so when you sign up for The Great Courses Plus. Visit my special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. You'll get 14 days of unlimited access for free. You don't want to pass this up, so go now to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. The hashtag I left because, which has become the cornerstone of the conversation we're about to have, was popularized by Dr. Chrissy Stroop. She is an ex-evangelical. She has written for The New Republic, The Economist, The New York Times, Religion Dispatches, The Conversationalist, and so much more. She's a graduate of Stanford, has a Ph.D. in modern Russian history and interdisciplinary studies in the humanities. She actually taught at a Russian university in Moscow for several years. And, of course, she has committed so much of her efforts in helping the apostate and telling the stories of leavers, people who have left cults, high-control religions, dogmatic faiths, and they found another world and even themselves on the other side and they want to tell those stories. Let's start by talking with Dr. Stroop right here. My friend, it's good to have you back on the podcast. Hi, Seth. Thanks for having me. 
You do an awful lot of writing and addressing of evangelicalism. I know you came out of an extremely controlling fundamental background. I'm of two minds, right? Part of me sees myself a former believer back in the day. I was a victim of bad ideas. I needed to be reasoned out of an unreasonable faith, and I ultimately was. And the other half of me sees a culture of people that have used their religion as an excuse to shut down all reasoning centers, to be bigoted and cruel, to distrust science and scientists, and generally make life much more difficult for the rest of humanity, right? And so these sides of my brain are always at war with each other. Do you go through that? Oh, yeah, I do. I mean, there are times when I feel this kind of generalized anger welling up in me again toward quote unquote religion, which I know is unfair because religion is a very diverse thing. And uh, even Christianity is a diverse thing. But you know, there are, are faiths outside of Christianity that don't even really require belief in God or supernatural anything, depending on how one interprets them. And I think that because we tend to think of Christianity when we tend to think of religion, and particularly Protestant Christianity has so influenced our society that we want to reduce religion to beliefs, and it's never just been about beliefs. But these bad beliefs, these bad ideas, as you put it, certainly have a devastating impact on American society where toxic Christianity is so, so powerful. And um, I absolutely want to combat that. And I do agree that a lot of the people who are deep in that cannot be reasoned with. And yeah, you know, you and I found our ways out. People do. But I don't think there is a scalable way to, uh, quote unquote, deprogram evangelicals or other types of Christian fundamentalists. So what's your tactic when you run into the absolutely closed minded? Well, I want to expose just how extreme they are to the wider public and to get a hearing for apostates uh, and for people from high control religious backgrounds in the wider public, because, you know, the broadly liberal American public and media sphere, let's say, are very susceptible to gaslighting from Christians who know how to put on a respectable face. And I mean, from evangelicals and others who do hold far right and extremist views, but who manage to make them palatable, the kind of people who are all about civility. You know, people like Michael Gerson, for example, and Russell Moore. And um, I think that to get a hearing, we have to get collective visibility. That's what hashtag campaigns are all about, like hashtag I left because. Because, you know, there's this whole genre of pastors and, let's say, pastor-adjacent concerned Christians writing about why young people are leaving the church and getting it all wrong. And that's where hashtag I left because came from, of course, because one of those perennial pieces like that was published in The American Conservative by Rod Dreher. He claimed the analysis came from some friend of his who wrote it to him. Whether that's true or or not, many people expressed doubt about that. He nevertheless published something that's basically just another example of that genre of, oh, kids these days, they're leaving the church because... Well, there's sort of two versions. It's either because we're not cool enough and we need more guitars and drums and we need to have awesome lights and dramas, or it's because they've gotten church light. They've gotten all these lights and dramas and guitars and they need the real good old-fashioned doctrine and or liturgy. Yeah, anything but we don't need it, we're not interested in it, or we just reject it on historical, scientific, and moral grounds, right? As people leave the church, they're sharing their leaving stories. The hashtag, I left because, starting to get noticed out there. What are you seeing? Yeah, you know, people leave for a lot of reasons. And some say things like they just never really believed it or intellectually they couldn't deal with it. But a lot of the stories are much more personal than that, you know. And we're seeing, again, a lot of exposing of racism, sexism, patriarchy, anti-science attitudes, all these kinds of things that people experience in the church. People don't often associate these quote-unquote love religions with trauma, but Mm -hmm. much trauma happens, right? I mean, they window dress it with the language of love, but it's there's a dark underbelly to this beast. Absolutely. There's a great song by Death Cab for Cutie, called gosh what is the title of that song i'm, I'm sorry um, you lie hang on uh, maybe i'm showing my age death what uh death cab for cutie all right i'm googling death cab and, uh, for cutie alternative band they've been around for a while now okay. and they have this great little song called i will follow you into the dark 
And uh, there's a verse in there that goes, in Catholic school, as vicious as Roman rule, I got my knuckles bruised by a lady in black. I held my tongue as she told me, son, fear is the heart of love. So I never went back. A lot of people talk about this really twisted notion of compulsory love. You know, I grew up in the church. I never stopped to really examine how twisted and broken this model is. Love me or else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's right up there with you're making me do this. Stop making me hit you. Stop making me punish you. Love me or I'll send you to hell is not really very loving, right? Certainly it's not unconditional. <laughs> I would encourage everybody in the audience to share their stories, uh, whether it's a tweet or a tweet thread. Chrissy, you say that some people are actually sort of telling their stories in these little 280 character blocks on Twitter with the hashtag I left because that and any other options you recommend? Well, I know that Lauren O'Neill and I are still looking to collect some more stories for a follow-up volume to Empty the Pews, Stories of Leaving the Church. Obviously, this is going to be limited. We won't be able to publish that many, and they need to be of uh, high literary quality. But we're expanding the conversation beyond Christianity this time. So we would welcome stories from ex-ultra-Orthodox Jews, ex-Muslims, and we want to focus more on more extreme or marginal groups. So ex-Mormon, maybe ex-FLDS, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, ex-Amish. But we will still have some ex-Evangelical and ex-Catholic stories. The um, initial deadline we set up for submitting manuscripts for us to look at is uh, January 11th, and that's coming right up, but we may fudge it a little bit. So I can get a link to you that maybe you can then link people to um, to a Google Doc where we have the information yeah. uh, about what's expected. And yeah, we, we welcome that. I think it's important that I, minds are changed for a variety of reasons, right? There's no magic bullet. But mm -hmm. in my own circle, I've noticed that I can throw data points, bullet points out all day, and I get almost no traction. But stories engage the mind and the heart. And I have found them to be much more persuasive, right? The power of the story. Absolutely. I completely agree. And, uh, you know, as a queer person, you want to look at the way that uh, getting stories heard and visibility change public opinion on things like same-sex marriage. I mean, it, it, it does. This is how you can make a powerful change if you can get those stories out there. And uh, so I want to encourage all of us to do whatever we can to tell those stories. And if we can find ways where we might sort of force the press's hand to finally take it seriously. I mean, when you get some serious press, that's when you're really making a big impact. Tell your story, tweet your story, blog your story, and hashtag your story with I left because, of course, the rest of this broadcast is going to focus on stories just like that. Dr. Chrissy Stroop. Thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Thanks so much, Seth. How did you leave religion? Why did you leave religion? 720, hi, who's this? This is Everett. Everett. We're talking about leaving stories, leaving religions, cults, etc. What do you have for us today? Well, sadly, I actually have two stories I can tell. The first one has to do with leaving Mormonism. I was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'd been sealed in the temple, and my wife and I were going through a divorce. That initially, wait a minute, we're eternally married. How can this happen? And in the Mormon Church, there is this mentality and belief in an eternal marriage where two people are married, and not just here on earth, but forever. So when I say I do with this person, I am literally saying, even after death, we don't part. And this is a contract that is made with God where he recognizes we have been sealed. We are now united forever. And this was what fell apart shortly after that. It was not even a couple years later that we ended up divorced. We were going to counseling. She brought up that she was going on a date, and shortly after that, we were seeing a bishop, a, a religious leader, discussing this, and it was laid at my feet that this was my problem. I determined God made this agreement with me. He got it wrong, obviously. I got it wrong, obviously. But how did he get it wrong? And I could never rectify that. I could never come to a conclusion that said, oh, yeah, of course, this is how an all-knowing God could get something wrong. And this was how I ended up having to leave the church. 
And uh, the second instance of you leaving religion? In essence, I was studying to be a pastor at Colorado Christian University, working at a church, handling their streaming service, when the lead pastor sent around his plans for a sermon, and I responded, honestly and truthfully, as I understood it, here's what I have just studied at at Colorado Christian University. I'd love to understand how that and this, you know, whatever it was he was saying would, would correlate, kind of shuffle together. And I was told in no uncertain terms to never do that again, to never question him like that again. And at that point, I didn't know what I had done wrong, other than that I was told by his son-in-law that it doesn't work that way, that when he asks, we're to give our support. And that was when I discovered the concept of a cult of personality. And at that point, started really questioning what was in the Bible, made the most intense study of the Bible I ever had even including studying it in Greek and Hebrew. Of course, I'm going to a Christian university at the time. And at the end of it, all I could find were contradictions, conflicting stories, nonsense, in my opinion. And at that point, I had to sit down with my wife and let her know, I have no problem with you attending church. However, I won't be going anymore. And I explained why. I appreciate you sharing your story with me and the audience today. And I'm glad you made it out, my friend. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Have a wonderful uh, week, life, all of that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sharon in the chat said something I want to camp out on for just a second. She said, people should just be able to believe whatever they want to believe. And I think in a perfect world, fine. The problem is that belief informs actions or inactions. And so when bad ideas or bad beliefs are out there, and certainly when those ideas are drilled into the skulls of impressionable and vulnerable people, especially children, it's not just that simple. People don't live in a bubble. People believe that vaccines cause autism. They do not then vaccinate their children. Who pays for that? The children and society as a whole. People believe that we are born broken and deserve hell unless we pledge a lifelong allegiance to a God, a specific God. And they not only believe that, but they train others to believe that, which means a life full of shame and magical thinking, the distrust of science and scientists and the othering of non-believers. Beliefs inform actions. You know, what is that line by Dillahunty? I really like it. It says, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. James Randi famously said, no amount of belief makes something a fact. Now, I don't just want to believe whenever possible. I want to know for sure. So this sort of pie in the sky attitude that, well, everybody, you know, it's your truth. Well, you know, I don't like spicy food. That's your truth. I don't look good in red. That's your truth. I don't like horror movies. That's your truth. We all deserve to be tormented in hell unless we pledge lifelong allegiance to a specific deity. I'm sorry. There's a burden of proof that's going to have to be met, right? The earth is flat. I'm sorry. That belief does not get respect. Why can't people believe whatever they want to believe? It's not nearly that simple. 618. Hi, who's this? This is Shannon. Hi, Shannon. We're talking about leaving, leaving religions, cults. Did you extract yourself from some specific faith? <laughs> uh, I extracted myself from a charismatic non denominational situation. Speaking in tongues and jumping oh, pews yeah. and tambourines and stuff, or what? Absolutely. When I was like eight or nine years old, my dad was in the Navy and we were living in San Diego and they started going to this big church that had like a campus and the whole nine. And when we moved away, my parents found another similar church, but it was much smaller. And they also had a school attached to it. And that's where I went from fifth grade all the way up to my sophomore year of high school. And yeah, I was indoctrinated for how many years that is, like 10 years or so. So 
I never really learned how to think. They just told us what to think. And of course, we did the memorization of the scriptures and all that kind of thing. Had chapel every Wednesday, had to wear dresses and skirts and all that kind of thing. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I started to kind of deconstruct and deconvert. But it wasn't knowingly. I'm not an atheist that can point to a time or a date and be like, oh, yep, that's when everything fell apart for me. It happened really, really gradually, probably over the course of 10 years or so before I realized one day when my little brother came to me and he was like, you know, I don't really think that there's a God. And I was like, you know, I don't think there is either. And that was the first time I'd ever even considered admitting to myself that I was an atheist or that I didn't believe. Was that terrifying for you? It was not. It was almost a relief to know that, oh, like, I, there's no reason for me to fear hell anymore or feel all of the shame and guilt and also have terrible rapture anxiety, which I think is a legitimate thing that people feel. When you experienced that rapture anxiety, did you read every headline and see everything in the world as a potential sign of God's return and the end of the world? Oh, absolutely. And if I were still trapped in that now, I would look at this COVID-19 pandemic and be like, oh, shit, this is it. Like, <laughs> this is the plague and pestilence that God is sending. Yeah. How are you doing these days? Oh, so much better. Now I'm a science major. I'm going to school for environmental geology and I'm doing great now, but it took me a long time to get here. It's funny when you talk about that sort of slow emergence. I saw somebody they'd posted there was a color spectrum on the left was red and on the right was green. And then you see this sort of gradient between them. And it says, show me the point where the red turns to green and you can't really pick it out. And that's a lot like how people sometimes emerge from the faith, right, from their religions or cults. It's a, a slow emergence. They can't pinpoint a specific spot where they're like, aha, that eureka moment. Yeah. And I went through a phase of a woo, a woo phase. I was Wiccan for like three seconds and then just kind of left everything and was like, eh, I don't think any of it's worth anything. Hashtag I left because, and I'm glad you did. That's good stuff. Thanks for calling today. I appreciate you. No problem. I didn't decide to leave my faith. That's one thing about the hashtag. I mean, I, I think leaving is the conscious decision to be honest with yourself. It's not, you know, I decided to stop believing because because that's not the hashtag, you know. But uh, I, I don't think you in that way choose what you believe. And I think it was for me about being honest about the doubts that were already there under the surface. It's hard. You know, if I was to sit down with a true believer in God, Christian God, Islamic God, whatever God, I try sometimes to start with the question. I'll say, if it wasn't true, would you really want to know? And reflexively, they say, well, of course I'd want to know. Yeah. But, and it, there's always, almost always a but at the end of the sentence. Oh, of course I'd want to know, but I know it's true immediately a defensive posture. And I think that's the difference between saying that you're going to pursue it honestly and being genuinely open to new information, challenges, criticism, and just saying it to make sure that you sound open-minded as you weld your brain totally shut. And I found that's an interesting thing. Maybe you've observed it in your own life. 402, hi, who's this? Hey, this is Mike. Mike, we're doing deconversion stories. What do you have for us? Well, I was actually raised Catholic. I went to 19 years of Catholic school, and in 2008, I finally came out as gay. Um, and at that time, I was still getting all kinds of stuff from my parents, like being gay is unnatural. And, and this is before they knew I was gay. I didn't actually come out to them until 2011. But, you know, my whole life, I was told that it was a choice. It was unnatural. And believe me, I tried to make the choice to be with girls, but it just didn't take. So yeah. uh, the first time I kissed a guy, though, I mean, it was the most natural thing I've ever felt in my entire life, you know. And so that kind of showed me the chink in the armor, I guess, of if the Catholic Church is wrong about this. What else could they be saying that was wrong? You know, they tell us that the, the bread and wine is actually Jesus's body and blood. And it's like a few people will die for that because they legitimately think that that's worth giving your life for if someone's going to desecrate it. But 
to me, it's, it's, I've never seen it turn to body in blood. So that's when I started questioning those kinds of things. And um, little by little, you know, I started getting, I don't know how I got into the YouTube thing. I, I ran across a lot of your videos, uh, Matt Delahunty. And I don't know if you've heard of Secular Talk before. I, I ran across uh, Kyle Kalinske's videos and kind of how he was relating those religion to politics and how he advocates for a secular government. And so that's when I really got into the idea of a secular government. And I think, you know, while that while I had that chink in the armor, I was still going to church. But it wasn't until the 2016 election that I finally gave up <laughs> and yeah. finally, finally released my uh, my hold on any semblance of religion. Uh, and sorry not to talk politics here, but I mean, that fact that the fundamentalist Christians and fundamentalists in general were supporting Donald Trump the way they were, despite him being the antithesis of what I would consider to be what Christians think is a Christian, it was a complete disconnect for me. And uh, my family fawned over Donald Trump. It was a realization for me that these people are willing to take all the stuff that he's saying, hook, line, and sinker, you know, what else are they willing to fall for? And so that was the end of it for me. A different kind of cult. And then, yep, exactly. I'm reminded of something I wrote in Sacred Cows when it came to the Catholic Church and its condemnation of non-heterosexuality. And I just always found it ironic that professed celibates who dress in elaborate costumes, who do not keep the company of women, and who disappear in secret rooms together for long periods of time are telling other people not to be gay. I just find that hugely telling. I just, it's an observation I was making, right? <laughs> you know, in my, the college that I went to, uh, University of St. Thomas, they've got a um, seminary there as well. So we'd see a lot of the seminarians. They would all march together to, to lunch and stuff. Really nice guys, but Part of being gay is I do have somewhat of a gaydar, and uh, <laughs> I feel bad for a lot of those guys because I really do think a lot of them are gay, and they just don't know how to deal with those feelings. It's a shame that people feel like they have to make that vocational choice just because they can't express who they really are inside. It's a lot like many of these sexually repressed cultures. I think, you know, they are denying human nature and they probably spend their whole lives struggling and praying and, you know, quote unquote, sinning and asking forgiveness. And then I think some of them just end up with an extremely broken model for sexuality. And then you've got the pedophile priest and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's just the whole system seems uh, a recipe for disaster. And for what? Because God cares what you do in your bedroom? It just makes no sense. I agree. What you're saying right now are all the thoughts that went through my head for the longest time. And uh, finally, it all clicked into place that, oh, they're making this up. Yeah. So it, just took, it took a while. I'm glad that uh, you are being authentic, that you're living an authentic life. I'm glad that you were introduced to you. I guess, is that an accurate way to say it? Like you had a chance a few years ago to finally figure out who you are, right? Yeah, absolutely. I've never, you know, in the past 12 years, I've finally been who I've always been inside. So it, it feels good to do that. It was, it was difficult and it's still difficult, you know, dealing with family, but it's worth the price. Well, that's something we can all take encouragement from. Be safe out there. Thanks so much for calling, man. I appreciate you. Hey, thanks, Seth. Appreciate it. You bet. Take care. It's hard, I think, to leave, especially when you are leaving the familiar. The familiar, even sometimes when it's awful, gives comfort, doesn't it? At least you know what's coming. Like the evil I know, right? And that's so often tragically true. It's the awful I know. It's the abuse, but at least I know what it is. I know what to expect. And in some ways, I've been conditioned to feel like what's out there beyond those walls is even scarier. At least here, as miserable as I am, as in conflict as I am, as oppressed as I am, at least I know. At least it's familiar. It's all I've known. I mean, that's a tragic place to be. It's understandable, especially when we're conditioned, often groomed by cults and religions to fear the outside. You know, we've lived our whole lives timid and wondering and feeling unworthy. It's, man, breaking out. A lot of people, I, and I get so angry with them when they say, well, God, I figured it out when I was six years old. What's the matter with these idiots who took decades to get out of religion? I mean, it's a completely unempathetic approach to often very damaged people who have made extremely courageous choices to bust out. It's just a terrible way of looking at it. It completely ignores the reality of programming 
indoctrination, conditioned response, cult behavior, where you have learned, you've been trained to distrust everybody else. Another James Randi quote, the first thing a cult does is to tell you that everybody else is lying. And you believe it. That's how Fox News becomes the number one cable, quote, news network in this country. We're fair and balanced. Everybody else, they're unfair and unbalanced. You can trust us. Don't trust anybody else. The quote unquote mainstream media. It's a brilliant business model, especially if you are a cult. They train you this way. And so learning to trust yourself instead of trusting authority, learning to lean on your own sort of inner compass to follow those you know, alarm bells of doubt instead of brushing them off as you have been trained from birth to do, it takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of guts. And if you have done that or you are going through that, let me encourage you, it's okay. And I take tremendous encouragement from you and I admire you for what you are about and for your courage and bravery. And don't you ever let anybody else tell you that you have to go at their speed or you have to do it their way. This is your journey. You take it on your terms. And if you're still in that sort of seeker, I don't know what I believe. I'm not really sure where I'm at. I'm overwhelmed by the options. I'm getting my bearings. The smoke is still clearing. Cool. I mean, that's cool. Don't rush. Don't force it. We are not dogmatic in saying that you need to think like this. The whole point was walking away from that line of thinking. We just want a personal relationship with reality. And honestly, if you do come to a point when you find God, whatever that means, and you can demonstrate that God, if we are genuinely rationalists, we want to know that. You know, call me. We'll talk. We are convinced that there's no evidence for any gods anywhere and that life is much better without these allegiances to superstition, so many of them cloaked in guilt and shame. But we're also truth seekers. If you discover a god and you can prove that god, call us. That's a conversation we want to have. 260. Thanks for waiting on me. Hi, who is this? Hey, Seth. It's Oz. How are you, sir? Oz, thanks for calling. We're doing the hashtag, I left because, leaving cults, religions, etc. What do you have for us? Well, I grew up in a, uh, uh, what I call a, a radical uh, evangelical church and family with a lineage of ministers and music pastors. So, slinging oil all over the place and speaking in tongues and running around the church. Um, so, I grew up, my earliest memories are in church. My mom was the music pastor there for uh, many, many years. So, you know, even our nights that the kids were out playing, we were at church. Mom had music practice or rehearsal or whatever. And I grew up like that well into my 30s. And at that point, my brother's still a full-time pastor of a church here in the city we live in and uh, was uh, the drummer there. I oversaw small groups, uh, was part of the youth ministry, city outreach. And then it was, you know, I started to question. It was a Sunday. There was a Sunday morning. I happened to have uh, one of the rare Sundays that I had no responsibilities. I didn't have to play drums. I uh, didn't have to worry about small group things. And I started listening to the lyrics of the music, which I didn't have to do very often because I was just playing the drums. I was worried about staying on beat. And I was like, man, so, you know, some of this is borderline creepy. And then my brother, the pastor, he started, I don't remember exactly what the message was, but he started sharing a couple of verses you know, and tying it to, you know, whatever his message was about. And I was like, well, hold on. I've read those verses, but there's also a verse over here that contradicts that. And it it was like a aha moment right in the middle of the church building. I was like, you know, I've never read this book in my entire life. Sat down and read this book without applying faith, the indoctrination, um, and all the things that I'd been programmed to think when I read it. And when I went home that day, I actually bought a brand new Bible without the highlights and the notes and all that. And I started in Genesis, and that's when my world started to fall apart religiously. Wasn't it Isaac Asimov who once said, the Bible properly read is the greatest force for atheism ever conceived? That was for you, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I always tell folks when I'm talking to them um, that, you know, I I barely got out of the second chapter of Genesis. Um, I hadn't even got to Exodus yet. (laughs) I barely got the uh, second chapter of Genesis, and I was like, I've been reading a, uh, and this is not to be an insult to any Christians that are listening, but this is what was going through my head. I'm literally reading like a children's book. Like we have talking animals and all kinds of craziness in here. And I've never questioned it once. 
What about your brother, the pastor? Are you on his radar? Um, <clears throat> I well, mean, you, they, you don't have to well, share anything you don't want to. I don't, I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm just curious. Okay. So you draw that line wherever you want. Not a Actually, you and I have talked about this a little bit before. I'm from the Atheist Roundtable. We, you and I spoke about this uh, when we talked. But, yeah, I'm, him and my mom both are always in pursuit. Like, my mom just set up, like, a conference call with me to talk to this historian from Florida, uh, this Bible historian. I'm like, Mom, I'll talk to anybody because, no, you know, until they have evidence, you know, it doesn't really matter to me. But my brother, it's a constant um, – he tries to be as polite as he can, but it's the same when that time comes. I don't want to see you separated from Mom and I and from God's love and grace and mercy. And I'm like, that's great, but it's almost becoming an insult now. Can we just not talk about this? <laughs> I get a lot of that too. Yeah. I love you and God loves you. And I'm like, well, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the text. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, whatever. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for your troubles, but I'm so glad to hear uh, that you're a fellow rationalist. Are you one of those people who know, you probably know the Bible now better than your mom does, right? Oh, yeah. I probably read, which my mom was shocked the one time we were talking about this. I said, Mom, I literally read my Bible now more as an atheist and as a skeptic than I ever did as a Christian. I know it better now than I ever did when I was a believer. And that blows her mind. I'm the same way. I'm embarrassed about how much I'd skipped over or excused or rationalized or, you know, I contextualized. Well, you know, it was a different time and God needed to be hideous and horrible and vengeful and, and genocidal because, you know, those people, they were uncivilized. <laughs> yeah. I, I, now yeah. I look at my own sort of weird tap dance that I was doing. I'm like, I'm sorry. It was okay to own other human beings' as property because it was thousands of years ago. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you and I have that in common, don't we? I told somebody the story the other day of the bitter water test, you know, when in the Old Testament, when they suspected the woman of oh, getting yeah, pregnant yeah. from somebody other than her uh, husband. So they bring her in front of this sort of male tribunal and they essentially poison her. And if she miscarries, they know she's a harlot. And I told that story. I'm like, how do you justify that? And I was speaking to a quote unquote theologian. And it's the first time they'd ever heard the story. Well, I don't think that's in the Bible. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait hang on. And I grabbed the pages, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you and I are in the same yeah, boat. I, I remember the, uh, you know, when I started my deconstruction and deconversion process, I remember one of the first episodes of the Atheist Experience that I heard. All in that one episode, he talked about biblical slavery and then also uh, in a Hosea where God commands the army to dash the children on stones and rip the babies out of the mother's wombs. And I, I remember having to pause it. I'm like, whoa, 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 that shit's not in the Bible. And I, yeah. <laughs> and I pulled it up. I'm like, oh, God, it's really there. Like, if, it's really only, there. <laughs> if only we had actually been looking when we were reading the first time, imagine how much more quickly we might have gotten out. You doing okay these days, my friend? Oh, I'm fantastic. I'm happier um, than I've ever been. And I love that now I can take, you know, a lot of the talents and the things that I used to use and love that now I can do it for the skeptic, the atheist community and make as many impacts and, you know, as big of a difference as I can. So, Well, thanks so much for being a part of today's conversation. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. You take care. Thank you, Seth. That's a great exercise, by the way. I, I mean, I wouldn't use it on everybody, but I have used it in the past. And uh, it's a variation on the Koran Bible experiment that those guys in the Netherlands did. They slipped a uh, Koran cover on top of the Bible and went out and read these horrible passages to passersby. And they were horrified. Oh, this is just a barbaric religion. Who could ever believe this crazy stuff? It just sounds like oppression and it's indoctrination. They want to control your lives. I mean, they were just totally, totally blasting Islam. And at the end, they pull off the cover and they say, well, actually, we just shared verses out of the uh, Christian Old Testament. And you should have seen their faces. And I do a version of this. I'll share the bitter water story, except I say it's in one of the surahs, right? Oh, the Islamic faith is crazy. They bring women in and they in the Quran and they make them drink poison. And if they miscarry the baby, it means they're a harlot. And they're like, that's just terrible. And there's another story about this warlord, and he wanted victory in battle, so he went to Allah, 
And he promised that he would sacrifice on the burnt altar the first thing that came out of his house, if only Allah would give him victory in battle. And he went out and he was victorious and he came back and it was his only daughter who walked out of his house and he'd made a commitment to Allah. And so he sacrificed her and burned her flesh upon the altar and Allah was pleased. Oh my God, that's terrible. What a barbaric religion. You know, just one story after the other. And then I'll say, well, You'll have to forgive me. I've been a little bit disingenuous with you, but the stories and the verses I just shared with you are not out of the Quran. They are out of the Christian Bible and their faces go sheet white. Uh, 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 tilt, tilt. Uh, 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 no, no, that's that's No, that's not in there. Right. And it's not that they know it is or isn't in there. It's because they've made an emotional connection to the Bible. And their first response is a defensive posture. So then the next step is to show it to them in black and white. Then I have uh, usually a, a scripture Bible, uh, a phone with Bible gateway, whatever. I have it ready. And I say, all right, well, actually, here's the book. Here's the chapter and here's the verse. Take a second and read that and tell me what you think. Tilt, tilt, eh, eh, eh. they just aren't processing. The point of the exercise, though, is that later on, after the emotions have settled, after the dust has settled, after they have a chance to be by themselves and perhaps even be somewhat honest with themselves, they're having to reconcile this. What was your response when you thought it was the Quran? You were outraged. How did that shift? How did your moral compass change when it was your own religion and not someone else's? This is what Dr. John Loftus calls the outsider test for faith. It might be useful in your own conversations. Also, real fast, Oz had mentioned reading song lyrics from his church and all of a sudden finding them creepy. And I had this same thought the other day. It was Amazing Grace, right? The classic Christian hymn. And it's got that line in Amazing Grace where it talks about how God came to save a wretch like me. I had never thought about that line until I got out of the faith, because it draws a huge red flashing circle around the reality that, despite all the window dressing of love language around Christianity, it is the language of an abuser. I'm wretched, right? I am a wretch. I deserve damnation, punishment, torment, whatever. I don't deserve God's love. I don't deserve happiness and fulfillment. I don't deserve any good. It is only God who comes to rescue me, and the goodness sort of flows through him into me. And I have to be allegiant for the rest of my life. I have to be 100% faithful. I can't look around. I can't sample at the buffet to find out what I really think. And if I ever leave him, he will hurt me. This is the language of the abuser. I call it the battered bride of Christ. Love me or I'll burn you. It's the language of abusers. 785. Hi, who's this? Hi, my name is Nate. Nate, what's going on? I was a Jehovah's Witness when I I was born into Jehovah's Witnesses, and so now I'm what's known in the community as physically in but mentally out. I've already left the religion mentally but bound because of family reasons. What keeps you in that structure? Uh, currently, it's my family, uh, my mother, my father, my grandparents, all kind of are still in, so in order to have any... Um, real meaningful contact with them you have to stay in the religion basically the jehovah's witnesses so, they're big on shunning right if they realize you're an apostate do they cut those ties would you expect that i would expect it from my family yes uh, maybe not my parents but definitely my grandparents and so it's one of those things where they're you know 75 few short years left probably kind of thing you you want to spend it with them it's a kind of blackmail though you don't get to be you. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's always such a pain about the cult mindset is, is also that everything is bad, but if you leave, you are bad. <laughs> yeah. 
Are you familiar with Lloyd Evans and the John Cedars channel? He's an XJW and oh, he yeah. does a ton and, of stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, that, that is him in combination with you. Actually, I suppose I could probably tell a little bit about what ended up happening. Yeah. Uh, what ended up happening is that the way Jehovah's Witnesses work, they're so insular, you know, they think it's the end of days, the last days, and that the world will end in the next five years. <laughs> so uh, that kind of mindset was drilled into me when I was really little, and the world is evil, it's not a good place. And then I started going to school, and while there was the occasional person who would be kind of like, well, why don't you join us for the Christmas thing? That's weird, you know, uh, in school most of the people were fine with it. You know, they, they were respectful of it. They didn't really tease me or bully me. And so I go through much of my high school till I'm almost like a senior. And I'm like realizing through like history courses and stuff, the world really isn't that bad. You know, like it's been 70 years since there's been any real huge wars, you know, it's been relatively nice. People are living longer and you just kind of go, wait, this whole thing is this, my whole life I've been told that things are going from bad to worse, but they're actually going from worse to good. But that is the thing where you just kind of go, wait, I've been told this my whole life. And then the people around me are great. You know, I actually, most of my friends were in what would be a non-denominational. I don't know if they were the they weren't so into it that they were the rolling speaking in tongues thing, but they were non-denominational. And I go, these people are plenty great. One of the greatest examples, it's a horrible example, but my best friend in high school, his mother committed suicide. And as a Jehovah's Witness, you really aren't supposed to go to other churches for anything because it's viewed as interfaith. And that's all bad. You know, the world is uh, Babylon the Great. And so I think we were sophomores and like, I agonized over whether or not to go. I, I did end up going, and it was a nice thing, but it was still one of those things where you're told that these people are awful, and then you go to a service, and it's like, it's really not that bad. That made me question Christianity, and because the way Jehovah's Witnesses work, they show all the flaws of other religions, but not their own. And so when you find out that they have the same kind of flaws, you go, I can't remember the exact verse from the Bible, it's, Lord, to whom else shall I go? <laughs> you yeah. know, you kind of stuck with this thing of where else will I go? And then the internet now, it's kind of easy to figure out, oh, hey, there's just this thing called atheism, which is a wonderful thing <laughs> where yeah. you don't have to believe in a God. Well, I know that's a tough religion to escape, but in your mind, you're free. Yeah. And that's the first step. Yeah. And uh, we're all pulling for you that... You can find your footing and navigate through that. Just know that whatever consequences are put in place, they put there. And, uh, you know, grieves me that oh, they yeah. have done that. Your life remains yours to live. That would be the encouragement I would give to you, okay? All right. Thank you, Seth. See you later. It's interesting when you step outside the boundary to understand and know people and things beyond the caricature of people and things that you were taught to fear. You fear what you do not know. I was afraid of atheists. Did I know any atheists? Not to my knowledge. I mean, I may have bumped into them, but I, I wasn't aware of it. Satanists. Oh, that's a great example. If I had run into Lucian Greaves, who is now a friend, co-founder of the Satanic Temple, if I had bumped into him when I was a devout believer, I would have treated him like he was radioactive. I wouldn't have gotten to know him. I wouldn't have asked any questions if he had any sort of satanic text or anything with a pentagram or Baphomet or whatever. I would have just lost my mind. Would I have cared at all about who he was as a human being or what TST was or what their value system or the basic tenets or any of that stuff? Of course not, because I was more interested in my in-group than understanding those who were outside of the in-group. And when you step over those boundaries and you start to introduce yourself, you find that there are people of other faiths who are lovely, beautiful, wonderful human beings. And you find there are atheists who are beautiful, wonderful human beings. And you find there are people who don't live in the United States 
<laughs> who are beautiful. I mean, you know, I came out of that America is the world mentality. Like, I don't care what happens on the rest of the world. We're the greatest country on the planet. Blah, blah, blah. And you come out of that and you realize we are all the human condition. I can root for the home team. Fine. But it doesn't mean I have to diminish anybody else anywhere else. We are all brothers and sisters on this planet. We are the world, like the song says, you know. But uh, when you are locked in that cocoon, man, you have othered people to the point where, you know, everything's terrifying. It's, it's a terrified existence. Many of these people live. They just look around. They look under every rock. They're looking at the blood moon. They're reading the book of Revelation or whatever. They're reading QAnon websites. <laughs> they're just terrified. What a pathetic, horribly wasted life that is. And there's some things in this world we need to be genuinely scared of. But to manufacture the fearful things, what a waste. What a tragic Tragic waste. 618, who's this? Hey, Seth, greetings from the open road. This is Neil. Neil, thanks for calling. Where are you driving? I just recently crossed the uh, Ohio-Indiana border heading for Illinois. I hope you're safe out there. What's on your mind? Do you have a story for us today? Actually, I do. I'm sort of an apostate twice over. I went from being Catholic to being pagan to being an atheist. The Catholic was actually fairly simple. My mom tried to raise me Catholic, but after getting kicked out of two Catholic grade schools, she kind of gave up on it. I've heard the pagan thing is actually kind of I'm fun. Sorry. Would you verify that? Uh, sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. It depends on what denomination of paganism you get into. All right. There are some people who say that there are as many denominations of paganism as there are pagans. So. I have heard that. I've heard it's like Hinduism. You know, it's like 31 million flavors. Just mm -hmm. pick the one you like. <laughs> Or just take bits and pieces of the ones you like and mash them together. That's kind of what I did. Well, I mean, I found myself doing some uh, of that in Christianity. It's like a cafeteria plan. Ah, oh, that's not tasty. I guess I'll leave right. it on the bar kind of deal. How'd you get out? Oddly enough, it was a combination of YouTube and myself. Kicking around YouTube, I came across R and Raw, Dark Matter 2525, you. And I listened to all the things that you guys kept saying, and my brain started arguing with itself. And one of the things that I believed was that you could gain answers through meditation. So I sat and meditated on the question of, have I ever actually gotten an answer from a spiritual or supernatural source that I didn't already have myself? And after honestly an analyzing it, I realized the answer was no. So was it one of those things where... When you, your conscience was sort of telling you something, your moral compass, your evolved ethical systems were sort of leaning in one way, your intuition, whatever. Did you assign a spiritual force to that for a while? Oh, God is leading me in that way? In a way, yes. As a pagan, I always viewed the gods as more teachers than cosmic overlord of the Christians and all the Abrahamic religions, really. They were the great philosophers. They just happened to be rooted in various religions. Right. It's like the, I kind of got the impression that they were guiding my steps, and then I just kind of realized it was me all along. Isn't that the way it goes? You realized it was you all along. You doing okay these days? Oh, yeah. It's been a little bit of an adjustment. I actually ended up deconverting my wife as well, who was also pagan. That's a one-two punch, man. The whole family's getting liberated. Well, be safe on the road. I'm yeah. so glad to hear from you, and thanks for calling the show, my friend. I always see you, bud. Thanks a lot. All right, see you later. People are leaving in droves, leaving the church, and they are telling their stories with a hashtag, I left because. More of your stories on the other side of this. If you want this broadcast early and you want it totally commercial-free, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. And thank you so much for your support. Let me take a few minutes here and speak with Kimberly Stover. I became aware of her on Twitter. She is an apostate turned activist, and I think she has a lot of insight about leaving religion, the implications and the possibilities. I don't know. I'll just let her sort of flesh things out in her words. Kimberly Stover, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me on. All right. We're talking about 
Hashtag, I left because. How did you leave religion? Well, let's start with you and what religion you came out of. You were an evangelical in what way? Um, I actually grew up in a Baptist church. The Bible is literally true. Adam and Eve yes. walked the earth. Yep. The Bible is literally true. King James Version was the supreme version, so it was a KJV only. You ever um, wonder where they get that? I mean, like, they're not going back to the Hebrew and the Greek. For some reason, the King James was, in their minds, in some ways, the original. I always thought that was weird. I think it's weird, too, and I think it's another way of them to isolate themselves from others. It's another way to maybe make them feel superior to other religions. We're holier than thou. Yes. That's the story of tribes anyway. We're special, yep. we're better, rooting for the home team kind of thing. Yes, and what's interesting is if you just read the King James Version, you don't get the whole story. A lot of my deconstruction started happening when I began reading other versions. Do you remember an app called Version? No. You version, it was an app, and I loved it because you could read the Bible in any version. It was beautiful. It was on the iPad. It was fun. You could take notes. But that really opened up my mind into different interpretations of Scripture because you could read any of them. So I feel like if, if a church only suggests KJV, you're kind of limited in a broader perspective of what Scripture is saying. Conservative Baptist, that's uh, hell, right? Literal hell fire. Don't want to go to hell. Don't want to burn forever, right? Yes, literal hell. So we uh, were given an image of not a drop of water would cool our tongue in hell. That's the image that we received. How old so were you was, when they started to talk about this place? Oh, I mean, I remember learning about it before I could tie my shoes. When I got saved at six, I remember it was because I didn't want to die on the school bus the next day. So I got saved. You consider that to form a child abuse? It's such a hard pill to swallow for me because I have so much respect for the people that I grew up with and that raised me in that church. I, I loved everybody in that church, and I don't think it was intentional by any means. I think they were protecting us from hell because they were abused in the same way that I was. It was a collective abuse, basically. Everybody was terrified. So I think it is child abuse, but I I don't think it was intentional. What if we were to say something, on, and I'm working it out in my own skull, that it does a lot of damage, but the intent for many is not malicious? Yeah, that would be fair. Yep. How long did you carry the fear of hell with you? Did you carry it well into your deconstruction, your deconversion? Oh, absolutely. I probably believed in it until I was 30. All right. So 30. when did you crawl out of religion? Um, around that time. When I read Rob Bell's Love Wins. Are you familiar with that book? Yeah. For my listeners who aren't familiar with Rob Bell, he was an evangelical Christian mega pastor who came to the position that no moral God would ever create or implement hell. And then fundamental Christianity rejected him. Yes. And his book was full of just questions. He wasn't stating, this is the truth, or you have to believe in this, this is what I believe. He, it wasn't approached that way. He was simply asking questions that most of us were always asking in our heads. And then he talked about early Christianity, and he talked about their interpretations of what hell was, and the Greek, and the original Hebrew, and the fact that Jews don't have a concept of hell. So Jesus was a Jew. He didn't have a concept of hell like fundamental Christians have it today. So reading his book, I was relieved because it was almost like, oh my gosh, I've had these thoughts my entire life, and now I have scholarship to back up what I've been thinking my entire life. And after that, fear went away. Then it really started rolling. And it's almost like you can't put the gorilla back in the cage or you don't want to. Yeah, you can't unsee what you see. And it was life saving for me because you can't move on from toxic belief systems until that terror is removed. 
What started this journey for you? Hashtag I left because. I have always been a doubter. I have always been someone to ask questions because things did not add up at all in my mind. I remember being five or six and sitting on the marble fireplace and asking my mother, who created God? You're telling me that God always just was here. Okay, well, who created God? Because in my mind, that doesn't make any sense. Just all of a sudden, you know, there's this thing and he controls everything. And she gave me the answer that most fundamental Christians will give. And it's just, well, he always was and he always is. He always will be. And that just didn't satisfy me at all. And ever since, you know, I was little, I was always pressing against things because it just did not make sense. Yeah, but Kim, I mean, now it's on your mom's radar. Hey, wait a minute. My daughter's asking some pretty pointed questions. Did she start to raise an eyebrow? Yeah, we were always on the opposite ends of things. Always. We always fought about stuff because I was always asking questions about this religion and about what I was what I was supposed to believe. And so it did put us at odds and it has put us at odds. But my whole life has been spent kind of trying so hard to fit the mold that I was supposed to fit, but I couldn't. And so I became rebellious as a teenager. I became, you know, I was partying, I was drinking and smoking and I wanted to experience the world outside of the church because To me, I saw a lot of hypocrisy and I saw a lot of the holier than thou attitude and the bullying and the anti-gay and I didn't, I didn't like it. So I always made friends with those on the outside. So I was always a little troublemaker, I guess I would say. And then I went to college and that opened a lot of doors in my mind as well. You know, it's kind of difficult to take an anthropology class and not ask yourself some serious questions about young earth creationism because it doesn't add up with the fossil record. It doesn't add up with anything that I'm learning in this class. So you feel like you're sinning taking this class. You know, I can remember like praying like, God, I'm sorry, you know, I'm taking this class and I'm not seeing things the way I'm supposed to see them. So it's mass confusion in your brain. I took a lot of philosophy classes and I learned, you know, about critical thinking skills and philosophy of religion and it didn't totally break down, but all of that planted a lot of seeds in my mind. So years later at 29, when I found myself really, I moved away from home. I moved two and a half hours away from home when I was 29 and that kind of allowed me the space to really dig into the questions I've always had because I no longer had any expectations. I could do whatever I wanted because I was two and a half hours away. And so I began to really study the Bible and hit the reset button, I call it. And I began to see things in a completely different perspective. Would you call yourself an activist? A lot of us who come out of the faith, right? We got a fire in our belly. I am absolutely one of those people. And I constantly get uh, misunderstood as someone being a crusader against Christians. And I don't feel that's fair because I'm not a crusader against Christians. I'm a crusader against the toxic system. And just because I'm critiquing your system doesn't mean I'm attacking you personally, but they don't know how to deal with me because they feel like I'm attacking them. And it can be very frustrating because I see the ways in which this belief system hurts them. I've seen it my whole life. I've seen it hurt every single person that I love. And whether they're aware of that trauma or not, I see it. So it's frustrating because I just want to set them free like I've been liberated from it. And it's difficult. It's a difficult place that we're in. Those of us that have that fire in our belly, it's, it's not an easy road to travel, but... When you say it's hurting them, what are you talking about? Well, I think, number one, the terror of a cruel God that would send people to a eternal fire chamber is absurd. And that is terror. That is absolute frightening terror for especially children. I've seen it hurt people in ways of 
they're cut off from their fellow human. So it's us and it's them. And I'm not allowed to have a boyfriend that's not a Christian. You know, I have to work so hard to convert these people or I can't be friends with them. So they're missing out on enriching friendships. They're missing out on enriching relationships. They're missing out on a broader life experience because they can't be outside of their echo chamber. So they're not experiencing the richness of life. And it's harmful. It's harmful for LGBTQ kids to grow up in the church. I realized that I was bisexual when I was around 12. I realized it, especially when I was 15, 16. And I was terrified that if anyone ever found out about that, And at this point, it was just secret. I had never done anything with a woman ever, and I still haven't. But it's something I know that I am. So you don't want anybody to know about it. So you live in this secret because you're so terrified because you know that you'll lose everybody in your family if they find out that you are bisexual. So it's terrible. It's it's awful. It, It completely makes for a very hard life. I'm also interested in how Christianity, you know, the window dressing is love language. Jesus loves you and love, 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 and love one another. But the truth is, is that this is an abusive relationship. It is absolutely an abusive relationship. It's a narcissistic, abusive relationship. And I stand by that. I truly believe that the God that I grew up believing in was a narcissist. And this set me on a path to meet other narcissists in my life, because that's what I was primed to want approval from. So this affected your person to person even, and you can take this as far as you want and no further, but even romantic relationships, you had been sort of preconditioned to respond to kind of an authoritarian, maybe a male authoritarian. Was that what you're saying? Yes. Yep. But not so much authoritarian, but more of, um, emotionally unavailable because God is emotionally unavailable. So it primes us to worship and love someone. And this someone is supreme being who is absolutely not there. He's not there in our perception. He's not there in physicality. He's not there. We're always yearning out for his presence. We're always yearning out for his voice So it's conditioning people to constantly have this unfulfilled yearning. Oh, and we're always waiting for his return, you know, through the rapture. So we're constantly waiting for a lover's return. Basically, it's unrequited love and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. It's a bizarre dynamic. All right. So you hit 30. You decide, hey, it's all a bunch of BS. I'm done with it. I'm going to speak out against it. What's your life look like today? Oh, I just feel very liberated. Um, Just, I don't have a codependency issue anymore. I'm sober. I'm finding a lot of purpose in life. I'm finding out who I really am aside of this religion. I have so many friends of different religions and backgrounds and sexuality and gender. I just feel like I'm really experiencing life as it's meant to be experienced. It's it's awesome, honestly. And it, But it didn't come without a lot of struggle. I mean, it took me 10 years to get here, honestly. It took me 10 long years of really going through this before I feel now I am finally on the other side. Kim, where do uh, people find your work? How do they find you and your activism, et cetera? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is realkimstover. You can find me on Instagram at Kimberly underscore Stover underscore writer or my website at Kimberly Stover dot com. Hey, I'm so glad you made it out. You know, you and I have that in common. We came out and now we can speak to the culture we escaped from in the hopes of maybe helping someone else. And I know that you are very much doing that. And so you're greatly appreciated. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. So many people on the switchboard wanting to tell their story. 320, who's this? Hi, Seth. My name's Michaela. Hi, Michaela. I left because that's the theme of the show today. What do you have for us? So, my story that I'm going to tell you is almost the exact opposite of yours. I watch your lectures because I get lonely and it makes me feel like someone's talking to me. And, um, pardon uh, me, though, I am going to talk a little bit about 
unhappy domestic situations. So if that type of thing, if you're listening, if that upsets you, uh, perhaps you may want to go away for a little bit. So I grew up in a completely secular home, anti-Christian home, in fact. And um, it was horrible. It it was terrible. Uh, my father, he's just a textbook narcissist. He knows it. He's embracing it now. He's just finally accepting the fact that he doesn't feel remorse and he doesn't give a shit about anyone or anything. He was a trucker, uh, like the previous caller. He was, he was almost always gone. But when he was home, it was just the worst. Like, we would stay late at work and we would busy ourselves, me and my three siblings. We would just do everything we could to not be home, right? And uh, I ended up living with my mother for a bit there, just to sort of get away from all that. And she was worse. It was worse. So if I had to be better, it was worse. And there were some Christians sort of among my friends, and uh, they would talk to me about Jesus. And uh, they would say, well, you're always really sad. Why are you always so sad? Like, don't you want to feel better? Don't you want to not be sad? And I'm like, well, yeah, because I didn't understand that I was dealing with some, like, seriously convoluted things. I didn't really understand what was going on or that what was going on wasn't normal. And so they sort of promised me that Jesus would make me feel better, right? And I think that that's incredibly malicious. Uh, It's done with good intentions, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think anyone's doing it because they know it's not true and they're just trying to win you to the cause. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think they mean well. So I started going to, I was 15. I started uh, like reading the Bible, constantly reading the Bible. Could not get enough of it. Like people often say I, I, that they didn't read the Bible until later and it sort of helped them leave the faith, which is partially the case for myself as well. But I, I, I knew it so well that when I would go to church, the pastors, they would preach things, and I'm like, actually, it says this. Like, did you read this? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, I ended up going to Bible college because I thought that would be, you know, sort of the thing to do. But uh, this made it much, much worse. And my parents would ridicule me because of Christianity. But it is it completely the opposite of what most people experience. And uh they would say, uh, you're just, you're wasting your life. Why would you, you have so much potential? Why are you throwing it away on this? But I, I needed sort of that escape, right? I needed that comfort of, of knowing, quote unquote, that I wasn't alone. And that when I, you know, when I was 16 years old and uh, everybody was, you know, screaming, going on in the house, no, none of my siblings, we wouldn't, none of us talk and do each other, all of us afraid. You know, when I was 19, I would come home and there would be holes in the wall and everything that was in the kitchen is destroyed in the other room now and trying to clean it up before, you know, my other parent comes home uh, so they don't have to see it and uh, just, uh, you know, watching the abuse and and everything. Um, It was my escape. I'm not a psychologist here, but there's a lot of layers to that onion. Do you feel like the idea of the Heavenly Father helped in your mind to sort of replace what you had lost in an earthly father? Was there any of that going on? It did. Yeah. And I would struggle so much with it because they would say, well, God is love. And I'm like, well, that doesn't tell me anything. I don't really know what that means because I I wasn't really taught how love. I was taught very well how to hate, but I wasn't taught, I wasn't taught how to love. I wasn't taught what love is. And through no fault of the individuals around me, they didn't know either. I mean, for God's sake, my two of my dad's brothers both killed themselves because of the horrible situation that he was raised in. And, I can't blame any of them for any of it. And uh, so it's like they would say, hey, God is love. God is your heavenly father. And I'm like, that doesn't help me. What does that even mean? And uh, so that was sort of part of the part of it. And uh, I ended up, uh, long, long story short, I, uh, it's a very long story, but uh, I ended up, I'm in Ohio now. I was born and raised in Minnesota. So I'm in Ohio now living with some people and, uh, so I start going to this, this Catholic class, right? Because uh, now that I'm sick, I can't drive, and uh, my uh, sort of ability to do things is quite limited now. But they were happy to, to drive me to this like church meeting. This this uh, it's a uh, RCIA right of the uh, something. It's confirmation for adults in Catholic church. Okay. Right? And I wasn't interested in becoming a Catholic, but I needed some people to hang out with, people to talk to, and um, so I started going to this class, and I started asking questions like, well, why am I supposed to just take this on faith like this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and they would just say like why are you here like why what and they would get, I would ask a question and I could hear everyone in the class like oh, like so annoyed and I was like it matters though like why are you not asking questions so eventually it sort of just it sort of just clicked with me I'm I'm uh 
of uh, ironically, I have a I have a, a doctor who's a young earth Christian, and uh, I was a Christian too. So we would talk about Jesus, and I, I all my whole life I would have these these, these horrific night terrors, right? All constantly. I hadn't uh, slept with the light on for like three years, but only just recently I have been able to sleep with the light off. I'm 25, you know, I should be able to. And uh, he would always tell me this. You can the same advice everybody else gave me, which is pray and ask Jesus for peace. If you're having night terrors, obviously something's going on. Like, you just pray and ask for peace and that'll help. Well, it never helped. And I was on medication for it. I was in therapy, fucking shitload of therapy, sorry. Tons of therapy and uh, still night terrors, still waking up screaming, still just the worst, right? And uh, so my doctor, of all people, he's, he says, go and go and read the Bible some more. Like, just what little faith you have, take that and, like, go start reading the Bible again. So I start reading the Bible again, and I'm like, this is this is kind of fucked up. <laughs> like, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is what, uh, this is no, what love is. That should be embossed <laughs> under Holy Bible. <laughs> Right, and I would give you credit. <laughs> Holy Bible, this is kind of fucked up. That's perfect. Well, thanks. <laughs> so I'm reading it, and I'm just like, I'm like, you know what? I don't think that this is love. I don't really know what love is, but I'm sure that this isn't it, right? And uh, it, it's you a lot of you. I actually, uh, I'm a writer. I got my first book published when I was 20. Uh, so, uh, if I may read what I just wrote in my journal that night, yes. um, I wrote. Uh, I've come full circle and I'm, I'm back to being an atheist, but I want the comfort of knowing, quote unquote, that there is a being that knows me and loves me. I still fear hell that doesn't exist, but I no longer feel the anxiety of trying to please God. I accept the fact that this life is all that exists, and the fact that my death will one day mean the end of my consciousness makes me happy. Life is shitty. Who would want to live forever anyway? The inherent meaninglessness of life doesn't mean we can't find purpose. I choose the absurd, as Camus explained, finding meaning in the chaos. And um, since then, just everything's gotten so much better. Um, I'm still sick. Obviously, that doesn't change anything. Um, I have had Christians say ridiculous things to me. Like, uh, I said something on Facebook that I was having an Eli Roth marathon. And uh, my former pastor was like, Molly, and you wonder why you're sick? You're watching horror movies? And I'm like... Yes. <laughs> Cannibal Holocaust is what ruined my nervous system. That's Eli so Roth accurate. films are in fact, they're sending <laughs> demons into your hearts. <laughs> if anyone's films would, it would be his, though, to be fair. <laughs> I'm thinking Michael Bay. But, Anything Michael Bay does, that's just evil. That would infect me with evil, I think. So, uh, Well, I'm sorry, you know, f- for the physical ailment, but it sounds like you're free in every other respect. You know, and I'm glad you're able to laugh about yeah. it. That's, uh, you know, that's something. A lot of people I know are, are, and as you write, I'm reminded of, uh, was it Chrissy who said, uh, write from your scars, not from your wounds, meaning you need to sometimes get perspective when you come out of a painful situation and then you can, you can begin to reflect. And that's pretty profound stuff that you had written. It sounds like you're writing from scars, but you are, are you healing? I mean, you doing all right? Oh yeah, I uh, thanks to uh, mindfulness meditation. Actually, I uh, I discovered Sam Harris, so I would just fall asleep listening to Sam Harris lectures, and then I found his, I found the Waking Up app, of course, and so now I have a, a meditation practice, and uh, that's helped a lot. And uh, I don't seem to fear death anymore, which has been remarkable in you know sort of the alleviation of my night terrors. I don't really have to worry about that anymore, which is amazing. Uh, there's nothing. Not a lot of things worse than uh, avoiding going to sleep because the things that happen to you when you're asleep are worse than when you're awake. <laughs> well, for what it's worth, I know there are people listening right now who can relate directly to your story, and you speaking here is helping them. I'm not, I don't, that's not hyperbole. I'm not blowing smoke at you. You being transparent and, and sharing your story on this public platform helps people. So be encouraged, okay? Because you are part of the solutions out there, okay? Thank you, Seth. Thanks for calling. Be safe. Take care. Okay, bye. Uh, Bye-bye. It's interesting that people were saying, I'll pray for you or I'll throw a scripture at you in a moment of crisis in your life. And this is a complex issue. A lot of people think that when someone says, I'll pray for you, They simply don't want to do anything. This is often the case. Don't get me wrong. 
It's a way to feel like you did something while not lifting a finger. I'll pray for you. But in many cases, this is the language of compassion that people have been trained to speak in in the church. You know, it's just a reflex. They really do care that you're in pain. But they also believe, genuinely believe, that prayers move mountains, that prayer makes a difference. This is another example of why beliefs matter, right? Because beliefs result in action or inaction. So if you believe that dropping to your knees and saying, Dear Lord, please feed the hungry, actually helps to feed the hungry, it causes you to disengage from the palpable tangible solutions of actually feeding hungry people. Beliefs matter. Why can't people believe what they want to believe? It sounds nice on a greeting card, but in many ways, bad beliefs keep us from finding real solutions. What about people going through depression? She mentioned night terrors. Well, you know, you just need to seek Jesus, or it's an attack of demons or the devil, because God would never be a part of depression. It has to be of the devil. So now you've got the baggage of guilt and shame, and do I not have enough faith, or do I have sin in my life? Have I not said the right prayer? Am I not living correctly? Am I not the correct kind of Christian? Maybe I'm not saved at all. I'm going to go to hell. It just adds baggage, 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 baggage. And for what? Bad ideas are causing people suffering from depression to be even worse than they would be. This has been true with prayers. Someone prays for healing. Then they are not healed, right? Someone says, I'll pray for you. That's supposed to be a net positive. Okay, fine. I've got a prayer warrior group of people. Fifteen people in the church are now praying for my healing from whatever I have, and I don't get healed. What then happens? Why didn't God heal me? I don't have enough faith. I'm not living correctly. I'm not the right kind of Christian. God doesn't care enough. To, God, God doesn't love me. Time after time, it places a greater burden on the recipient of the prayer. When, quite frankly, the tangible solutions that bring real benefit to people's lives, even from the church, are human action-reaction solutions. They dress it up in God speak, but people helping people, well, that's humanism. That's humanism. Stand by, I've got more show to come as we talk to more of our listeners about why and how they left religion after this. Even if you can't get through on the show today, I want to encourage you to, if you can, be public about how and why you left a dogmatic faith, a cult, a religion, a high control group that tried to tell you who to be and what to be and why. Tell the world why you left with the hashtag I left because. 864, tell me your name. Hey, hey. Seth, I'm just going to call myself Matt. That's fine, Matt. What's on your mind? My deconversion journey was probably uh, maybe two decades long, slowly. Been an atheist now for six years. My family still believes. Pretty much all of my family does. So, you know, that's a little bit difficult. I know you understand that. But I basically just kind of studied the Bible and just edged out away from Christianity bit by bit. You know, just trying to find the truth. You know, and finally... I had found some, some Dillahunty stuff. I had found some Christopher Hitchens videos and watched a lot of Dark Matter 2525 and basically just woke up one morning and was like, you know, I don't think I can believe any of this anymore, you know? Were you scared? Were you excited? Both? Well, I wasn't scared. Once I finally realized that I didn't believe any of it, you know, hell included, Man, I was actually really relieved. I mean, it's almost as if a huge weight is lifted off of you, kind of like you experience with salvation, you know, in, in, in your head, you, you just feel better if you go down and pray and, you know, God's going to handle it all. Well, I just didn't have to worry about any of that, you know, load of crap anymore, you know. And the brand of Christianity that I came out of was very restrictive, very cult-like, 
I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's an independent Baptist church where basically the pastor of that church is the be all and end all of everything. You know, he's rarely challenged. And if he is, they usually run that person off. So the, the only bad thing about it is my wife is still a believer. So I still wind up attending church often and just kind of sit there. I usually read, to be honest. I read on my iPad during church. But um, How does she feel about that? Wait a minute. Still, wait a minute. You pull out the iPad and you're distracting yeah. yourself. Does she get pissed off? No, no. She's very non-confrontational about it because she doesn't like arguing with me about it. And I mean, she's very intelligent. She just doesn't feel adequately prepared to meet my arguments. And then she has a huge amount of confirmation bias that, you know, she just can't see things. Not adequately prepared to meet our arguments. Is this not a great description of so many conversations that we have out there with believers? Yeah, that's right. Now I'm still working. And what's funny is I just came from a lady's house who happened to have a Ruth Bader Ginsburg mask on, but I live in South Carolina. So I think that may be a little bit more redneck and Christian and evangelical (laughs) than even Oklahoma. I don't know. I don't know. The brand is very different. We, in the, in the buckle of the Bible belt, you know, everyone you meet uh, nearly is, is, is a Christian of some sort, some brand, you know. We have that in common, but, uh, man. This this yeah, state is country yeah. church. Well, it's country church country. Yeah, country. <laughs> you know? right. and, the, and now the cult has ingrained Trump into all of that, you know, in the last four years. You know, it's yeah. Trump is almost a Jesus figure to him. No, he is. I, we is, actually have had this it, conversation. It baffles me, man. We've had this conversation about how religion often primes you for savior figures and authoritarian figures, authoritarianism, right? right? The savior figure comes along. He says, I alone can fix it. God has anointed and appointed me. And they are trained by their culture to hear the name of God linked to your religion. And you line up and those thinking centers just shut down. And it's maddening for the rest of us, right? Right. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're surrounded by it everywhere. Everyone almost I went to school with. I mean, I have two guys that I talk to. One of them's a really good friend of mine. And then one guy that I kind of hated in school. But now we can bond because he's very anti-Trump, anti-religion, anti-all of those things, you know. Yeah. But the other one actually was a missionary to the Philippines for a number of years. And we both kind of deconverted around the same time and sort of helped each other out through that which was great. And a lot of that, he just couldn't deal with all of the things that go on over there and couldn't reconcile that with a good God, you know? Well, um, I so appreciate you and your participation in this important conversation. Hashtag I left because I'm glad you left. And I'm glad that you were among the humanist and the reasonable and, you know, keep going out there and having those conversations whenever you can. Okay. That's right. And every day I learn more about myself because it is liberating. It's, it's, there's so much more freedom when you're not restricted by that religion, you know? That's another great subtitle so. for us. Thanks for calling. You take care. Yeah. Thanks, Seth. Have a good one. 626, who's this? Hi, this is Marie. I'm calling from California. And I'm a relative uh, new listener. I've been listening for several months now. And I left the Catholic Church, and it was a bit of a process, but I think that I first started questioning when I was in my teens. And I grew up back east, and I went to Catholic school almost my whole life. This was during the 60s, early 70s. And I went through all the things that you do when you're young, and I was baptized, of course, too little to say anything about it. Um, I went through the Holy Communion and the Confirmation and all that stuff. So once I got to my teen years, I started to really think about what I was actually saying and doing and how much it didn't make a lot of sense to me. But the thing that really, I think, pushed me over the edge was that at some point in my teenage years, I found out some things about my parents that I didn't know that had occurred in their past. And I found out that my mom had been married once before she was married to my dad. 
it didn't last very long. They were divorced, and then she married my father. They were married for a very, very long time, ultimately. Anyway, according to the faith, the Catholic faith, you're married to a person, you're married to them until death. So if you get divorced, well, there is no such thing as divorce. You are still married to that person, and if you marry someone else, you're committing adultery. So according to the church's teachings, my mother, she was raised in the Episcopal faith. My father was the Catholic, and he was actually excommunicated from the church because he married a divorcee. So when I found this out, some things started to make sense to me because my dad used to take my sister and I to church every Sunday, but he would never go inside. He would sit outside in the car, he would read the paper, he would buy some donuts, and then he'd pick us up when Mass was over. And I always wondered, well, why doesn't dad go into church with us? My mom never did because she wasn't Catholic, but my dad, I knew he was. He was an altar boy when he was a kid. He used to talk about it all the time. He read the Bible at home. He had a serious faith, it seemed to me. But he was told he couldn't practice his faith anymore, I guess, because he married my mother. So once I found this out and I kind of thought about that, I kept thinking, well, if I'm good and I live a good life and I do what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to live with God. I'm going to be with Jesus. It's all going to be great. But how happy would I be if I were in heaven, even with Jesus, if I knew that the two people that I loved most in the world were going to burn in hell for all eternity for what they had done, no matter how good they were, no matter whether they lived good lives, no matter how much good they did in their lives, they were doomed. And I thought to myself, how could I ever be happy in heaven if my parents were going to burn in hell for eternity? So that was probably the start of all of my questioning about the Catholic faith. And eventually, you know, I started thinking about the paradox of evil. Why does it exist? God's supposed to be all-knowing, all-powerful, all-love. Why is there evil in the world? You know, why does it still take place? Things like that. And I started to see more of the hypocrisy that was going on in the Catholic Church. I mean, they seem to be willing to take all of us kids as students in their schools and, you know, in their churches, worshiping and so forth. And they took my parents' money for tuition. We put it in the collection plate every Sunday. But they didn't really help us out very much. I remember once my father was out of work, he was sick, and my mom was really having a hard time putting food on the table and paying the bills. And she even went to the parish priest and said, well, Father, could you please help us? I mean, we're really in need. We give a lot to the church. We've always done that, but we need some help. Could you help us? And she said, well, you collect money in the poor box and in the collection plate, you know, every week. And he said, oh, no. He said that money is, is for converting the pagans. It's for the missionaries to convert the pagans overseas. And so she got no help from the church. So no sense of community there. And my parents, I found, actually signed a paper to allow us to go to Catholic school and be brought up in the faith and they agreed to uh, have us raised as Catholics, and we went to the church, we went to the schools, and so forth. But the priest, you know, used to come around to bless the house. Once a year, he'd bless the house and everyone in it, and we would all kneel down in the living room, and he would say prayers and so forth and bless the house. We would have to give a donation, of course, to the church. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember once the uh, once the priest came to bless the house and everyone that was in it, and my mom said, I'm sorry, Father, I, I don't have any money to give you this time. You know, my husband doesn't have any work or whatever the case might be. And he wouldn't bless the house oh. and the people inside oh. because he couldn't get some money out of us. So when I started to see these things for myself, I started to realize that they seemed more about collecting souls rather than saving them. And God seemed to need an awful lot of money. I just couldn't reconcile some of the things that I was seeing and hearing with what I was supposedly taught about the church. How often do we find out the churches are in the shakedown racket, right? God won't bless you if you don't give. We will mm -hmm. promise you then intangible blessings that you may not get till after you're dead. 
I mean, the business model, I guess, is brilliant, but it can often be so cruel. That's right. I was listening to your show for a while now today, and I was lucky enough to get through to get a call through, but I was listening to the point where you were making about cruelty and, and abuse the behavior towards the parishioners bordering on abuse. And I, and I felt that way after some of these things had happened, you know, in my family. And so eventually when I got to, you know, maybe like eighth grade, ninth grade, somewhere there, I just quit going to church altogether. I thought, you know, I just don't need this anymore. This just doesn't make any sense. I, it took me a long time to really break away completely, but I did. And uh, I think I'm much happier for it. It's like that scene out of Lord of the Rings, you know, when Gandalf looks at the king and says, breathe the free air, my friend. That's how I feel (laughs) about you. Breathe the free air. I appreciate your call. I appreciate it's such a great phone call. It's uh, been a pleasure to have you on the radio. and, And you just keep kicking out there, okay? Thanks so much, Seth. All right. Take care. Make a note to join me next Tuesday. I've got the privilege and honor of speaking with Dr. Donald Prothero. He's got a new book out. We're going to talk archaeology, paleontology, dinosaurs, evolution, lots of good science, and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's coming up next week. I'll see you then. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.